I think all of us in this room are just extraordinarily lucky to have somebody of David Nabarra's quality and passion in the position he is in the United Nations and, if you like, working with all of us to, to move it on. We want to keep as far as we can on time during the course of the day, so we're not going to have uh, any questions at this moment. We had hoped to have some, but we, we won't. There will be time a bit later on. I want now to introduce uh, Ray Suarez uh, and, and invite the panellists to come on stage. Ray has been a Washington-based senior correspondent for the News Hour on PBS since 1999. He also hosts the monthly radio programme America Abroad for Public Radio International and the weekly politics programme Destination, Destination Casablanca for Hispanic Information Telecommunications Network. I feel that increasingly here in the United States I'm going to have to learn to speak Spanish. <laughs> Ray has more than 30 years of varied experience in the news business. Before coming to P PBS, he hosted the National Public uh, Radio's nationwide call-in programs, Talk of the Nation, for six years. He spent seven years earlier uh, covering local, national, and international stories for NBC-owned station WMAQ-TV in Chicago. So, Ray, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, while my panel gets seated, uh, let me say in uh, sincerity and... Uh, sort of uh, a feeling of being flattered uh, how nice it was to be asked to be here. I cover global health for the PBS NewsHour, uh, so maybe across the years you've seen some of my stories uh, from the front lines where uh, these issues are of pressing daily importance. Uh, just in the past year, uh, I got to do some really good news stories, which are rare enough in this, uh, in this particular portfolio, uh, being in the highlands of central Peru at a uh, mothering house to watch as one district really forces down uh, dramatically uh, the rate of maternal and child death by doing cheap, easy things, not by doing expensive, high-tech, high-threshold work but finding out where the pregnant women are, getting them into care early in their pregnancy, and then uh, watching them and being close to them uh, through their deliveries. And yet, the other stories are too much with us at the same time. I was in central Mozambique a few months ago uh, and sat on the edge of a bed with a mother who was not well-fed herself, but had brought to the only hospital available in this part of Mozambique to treat 200,000 people, her four kilo two-year-old child, who was even too weak to whimper as she laid on the bed. The doctor whispered to me later that it was unlikely that child would see a third birthday. I do my work out of the conviction that people are pretty smart, that I don't get on a plane and fly to the other side of the world to tell them how much more I know about their problems and how much smarter I am than they are. People are experts, if nothing else, on their own lives. And I am not one of you, I am not of you, but I watch you and I watch your work. And I'm glad that there's somebody to stand at the tense intersection where idealism, aspiration, and compassion run smack into reality. The price of inputs, the availability of water, the cost of transportation of goods to market. Can we do all the things that David Nabarro and others were just talking about? It's good to know that there are uh, more than just a handful of people who are ready to come sit in a room and say, uh, yes, we can. But at the same time that I'm a sympathetic observer, I'm also a paid skeptic, but hopefully not one uh, that has surrendered to the particularly uh, virulent 
Washington form of the disease of cynicism. So uh, it's great, great to be here, and good luck to you in all your work. I have a tremendous panel to speak to you this morning. Uh, going from your left to your right, Anna Lardy is an associate professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Science at the University of Ghana. She served on WHO expert consultation task forces on child nutrition and currently leads the Ghana delegation to the Codex Committee on Nutrition for Special Dietary Uses. Uh, sitting next to Professor Lardy is Charles McCormick, president and CEO of Save the Children US and someone with such a long trail of, uh, of credits and work, I wouldn't be surprised if he knows two thirds of the people in this room personally. Uh, sitting next to Mr. McCormick, Kasim Masi, uh, the CEO of Zambia's National Food and Nutrition Commission, which is an autonomous body under the Ministry of Health in Lusaka. Uh, sitting next to Kasim Masi is uh, Shamim Haider Talukder, the founder and chief executive officer of Eminence, a nonprofit in Dhaka, Bangladesh, that is built around these issues of nutrition, reproductive health, and the environment. And last, but in no ways least, Paul Weisenfeld is the assistant to the administrator directing the Bureau for Food Security at President Obama's Feed the Future initiative. They've all been asked to uh, present an opening statement. I hope that as their moderator, I can beg their indulgence to stay within some kind of time envelope. <laughs> uh, on one level, an hour and a half for a panel looks like a really long time, but when you've got a, a panel with this much firepower and this much to say, it can all get chewed up pretty easily uh, just by opening statements. So panel, these people want to talk to you. Allow them that privilege by keeping your remarks elegant, brief, and to the point. Anna Lardi, let's start with you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I want to thank Brad for the world and concern for inviting me to, to this august gathering. I bring you greetings from Ghana. It is a delight for me to be here and especially to discuss an issue that is of grave concern to us, and especially those of us in Africa. At the moment, Sub-Saharan Africa is facing a serious crisis of hunger, poverty, high maternal mortality, and infant mortality. Maternal mortality, if you look at lifetime risk, maternal death in Sub-Saharan Africa is about one in 31. Compared to the situation in other developing countries, that is one in 290, and then in our industrialized world, about one in 4,300. In fact, it is becoming, uh, becoming pregnant and having babies in sub-Saharan Africa is a very dangerous business. I want to teach you a few Ghanaian words here. In Ghana, among the accounts, when a woman delivers, we say the greetings that go to her is kwa. We can also say ayiko. Both of them convey congratulatory messages. But the term kwa is used when a person has been through a life-threatening situation that could have cost her her life. So to use those words when a pregnant woman delivers is an indication of the precarious situation that women face in pregnancy. Infant mortality is high in Ghana, about 50 per thousand live births. That is to say, five out of every 100 infants die before their first birthday. Malnutrition is an underlying cause of the high maternal and child deaths. Children lucky enough to escape death from early malnutrition have to live with the irreversible consequences into adulthood. We have heard about the Lancet series, they've mentioned it, but the Lancet series showed that about 90% of malnourished children are found in only 36 countries, and Sub-Saharan Africa 
is host to quite a number of these countries. It is therefore not surprising that Sub-Saharan Africa is a region that lags behind the most in making progress in achieving the Millennium Development Goals. At the same time, there is good news when a country in Sub-Saharan Africa is on track to achieving a Millennium Development Goal. Ghana is one of the few countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that is on track to meeting the MDG-1, having halving poverty and hunger. Ghana's poverty rate reduced from 51% in 1991 to about 28%, 28.5% in 2006, thus becoming the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to achieve this goal. There are several factors contributing to the progress made by Ghana. Time will not allow me to go into details, but to mention a few. Review of, of our agricultural policies have resulted in increased domestic food production. The introduction of direct cash transfer to poor households has provided food and safety net for persons living under extreme poverty. Other programs include free maternal health services, poverty reduction strategies with a strong focus on infrastructural development, modernization of agriculture and enhanced social services are all contributory factors. The country has pro promoted nutrition specific programs such as national food fortification. Also, the Ghana uh, school feeding program launched in 2005 today feeds over 1 million children nationwide. The infant and young child feeding strategy of the country promotes exclusive breastfeeding for six months and adequate complementary feeding. The implementation of the community poverty reduction strategy, a World Bank funded project sought to achieve a sustainable, on sustainable basis, adequate nutrition and food security. I emphasize that Ghana could not have made these achievements without good governance and political stability. Despite all this, we still have a long way to go. Seven more out of the eight MDGs to conquer. It is clear that the best and fastest way to achieve the MDGs is to join forces and scale up nutrition nationwide. In this respect, civil society has an immense role to play in scaling up nutrition in countries. Today, we have 1,000 days in partnership with the Sun Movement, working hand in hand to support early riser countries to scale up nutrition. The Sun Movement, as was aptly described by Dr. David Nabarro, has a transition team at the core, but is supported by six expert groups called task forces. One of the six task forces is the task force C, responsible for civil society engagement in countries. Sun movement without the force of civil society will be like setting sail without the wind. Mr. Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, appropriately described civil society as the world's new superpower. If we look critically at global events in the past one year, one cannot doubt what can be achieved when civil society joins forces. The global community has an urgent task to perform, get high malnutrition burdened countries on track to achieving the Millennium Development Goals. Our task force C under the Sun Movement is engaging civil society in early riser countries to work to achieve the MDGs. Within countries, civil society can do a lot to scale up nutrition. To mention a few, civil society acting as a pressure group can promote good governance and accountability. Often, the inability to achieve the MDGs is sometimes due to political will. Civil society must hold leaders accountable to their commitments and to ensure that state resources are used in promoting health of the nation, especially addressing the MDGs. Civil society can monitor MDG progress within their countries, constantly reminding our leaders to implement the commitments they made. Civil societies within countries 
can advocate for getting the right policies that will promote the achievement of the MDGs. Civil society cannot work in isolation. Time is short and the goals to be achieved are high. We need all hands on deck. The MDGs can only be achieved through the collective efforts of all, governments, development partners, multilateral agencies, civil societies, businesses, communities, etc. Civil society has a track record of getting things done. Once more, there is a challenge before us to make the world a better place for all by addressing the Millennium Development Goals. So let's get moving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Larty. Um, and I guess thanks to Ray Suarez for uh, saying to be brief and succinct and uh, 10 minutes or less. Um, I'm reminded of one of my early speeches at Save the Children and, uh, and one of my young staff members got up after the talk and said, it's so exciting uh, to be with an organization whose CEO must have been an honors graduate of the Fidel Castro School of Public Speaking. <laughs> So uh, by 4 a.m., uh, I'll be done. Uh, really, more seriously, uh, 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 let me particularly thank uh, uh, David Beckman and Bread for the World and the Bread for the World uh, uh, volunteers who are here, and Tom Arnold uh, and the Concerned Worldwide people, um, my own uh, ancestors. Uh, came here, many of them, uh, in the 1820s and 30s because of famine in Ireland. And it's interesting to remember that even at that time, lots of food was available both in Ireland and England. Um, and yet thousands and thousands of people starved because uh, it was not available to poor people. And uh, in too many parts of the world, that continues to be the case. Uh, the, the topic of this panel is uh, building a movement um, and uh, uh, that is really, uh, uh, I hope, what we're all here to do, and, uh, um, and we will come out of this, as David Nabarro said, with, uh, with some plans and activities and commitments to make that happen. However, it is a little bit, uh, uh, watch out what you wish for, you may get it. Um, it's not easy um, to build movements. Um, what is a movement? Um, uh, a movement is like a team, I think. Uh, um, we all saw uh, Barcelona um, uh, win the uh, World Soccer Championship, and they really did win it uh, as a team, and that's the only way um, we're going to succeed um, in terms of ending hunger. Uh, and I will say uh, we do a lot of polling and analysis that save the children, and we have found, certainly with the American people, um, that ending child hunger is the number one uh, most uh, pressing and mobilizing commitment. So, so there really are practical opportunities here if, uh, if we can pull it all together. Now, it's a pretty multifaceted team, and unless it uh, plays well together, um, it's hard to uh, put the, the goal into the net. Um, We've heard from David Nabarro and others how many uh, different stakeholders there are. Um, first of all, citizens. Um, and when I first came to Save the Children way back, I did an early stint there. One of our trustees was Margaret Mead. She would come into the meeting with her Samoan uh, chief, chieftain stick. Um, but we all remember her statement that never doubt that committed citizens can make a difference. Indeed, uh, nothing has ever changed without committed citizens. So that, uh, uh, that's pretty key. Um, but we have in this world uh, UN agencies, we have bilateral donors, we have national governments, we have national civil society, we have corporations, foundations, media, celebrities, mega philanthropists, lots of different kinds of people uh, have to be brought together if we're going to succeed and, uh, and have to cooperate together. Uh, this has happened, and there are 
uh, many examples of successful global causes. Uh, when I was a kid, um, my family would uh, uh, take me, my mother and, and sister, um, to the woods of New Hampshire to live in a tent for the summer because the fear of polio was so pervasive uh, throughout the United States um, that no one uh, who could get out of the cities would stay in the city. So in one lifetime, um, we've obviously gone from um, a disease that was a nightmare um, for every parent and grandparent in this country to something that Americans don't think about any longer and most people around the world don't think about any longer. And it's interesting to realize that that essentially the near eradication of polio um, was, was essentially a private sector uh, driven activity. March of Dimes, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Jonas Salk and so on and so forth. The government had very little uh, to do, but once it was pulled together, obviously CDC and others uh, were crucial in rolling that out. So we, we have there um, an example of how corporations, foundations, NGOs, uh, media and so on can come together to solve uh, um, what had been an endless problem prior to that coalition forming. Many of you, I'm sure, um, worked in the Jubilee um, End Debt campaign in the late 1990s, um, a, a huge burden on the poorest countries of the world, and Bono and Congress and uh, many others, but particularly faith-based NGOs. Um, came together to, to make that very complicated situation uh, much, much better. David Nabarro uh, spoke about malaria um, and the fact that there has been an enormous reduction in the burden of malaria in just four or five years. Uh, and uh, among other things that's happened there is that uh, that group uh, used bed nets um, as a symbol um, that the public could rally around Obviously, it, it's only one of several interventions that are needed, but it was simple for young people and others to understand. They got the National Basketball Association behind it. Individuals could sponsor an individual bed net and so on and so forth. And it does seem to me in ending hunger, um, we all need to come up with some symbol that the publics around the world um, can rally around and, uh, and find a way to be personally involved. So. Uh, it does seem to me we have more work to do, number one, um, in bringing uh, corporations and mega philanthropists and others together. Given the world economic situation, um, governments are not going to come up with that $10 billion a year. Um, so we're going to have to find ways to reach out to uh, cor corporations, media, celebrities, and so on and so forth to join in on this, as well, obviously, as our partners in the South. Um, at Save the Children, um, we have a worldwide uh, campaign to uh, um, end, uh, well not end, but significantly reduce uh, child hunger and also uh, a newborn maternal and, uh, and child mortality. And we're working hard, again, to have a very concrete uh, goal that people can get behind, which is to add uh, one million frontline health workers um, to, to the gap of people on, on, at the community level. That's something the public can get behind. We've gotten the Advertising Council to do their first ever international campaign, $35 million a year of advertising and social networking just in the United States alone. We want to get four or five million people around the world behind that. And those frontline health workers can also help um, uh, with with nutrition, breastfeeding, complementary foods, uh, micronutrients, and all the kinds of things we know um, work in terms of reducing uh, maternal and child uh, uh, malnutrition. Everybody's going to have to work together better. I think we in the non-governmental world, international and national, uh, we've got to kind of get up out of our black individual black holes um, and uh, look at this in a more holistic way. Um, and as I say, I think we're going to have to be more creative and aggressive um, in bringing in other private sector actors. Um, in Save the Children, um, we have a major uh, program in Bangladesh. We'll probably hear more about nutrition in Bangladesh, but 
significantly funded by PepsiCo um, and working closely with Tufts University. We couldn't, and then, and then with any number of, of Bangladeshi non-governmental organizations. But there's an example of corporations, international NGOs, national NGOs, universities, all working together to produce a more strategic result than any of us could have done individually. Same thing in Vietnam, we're doing a, a national level, uh, nationwide program to reduce uh, um, maternal and child malnutrition in that country. It's led by the government of Vietnam. It operates at the provincial and district and community level, um, but it's got UC Davis, uh, it's got IFPRI, it's got a whole group of of think tanks and universities and government entities and international NGOs. So we're gonna to have to work together better, we're gonna to have to play as a team better, uh, but the moment really is now. There's never been as much energy around this. Uh, the science is there, uh, the opportunities are there, the examples are there. Thank you all for your commitment to this cause. Let me take this rare opportunity to actually thank the organizers, uh, Bread for the World, and Concern Worldwide. I also want to take this opportunity to pass a greeting to the pre pro, uh, from our president, uh, Mr. Uh, Lupia Banda. Now, I'll take you a, a moment, I'll just go through, uh, to just give you a precis of Zambia's approach to scaling up uh, nutrition, the sun. Now, I wanted just to give a, a real moment. I'm sure some of us may not know where Zambia is. Now, now if you look at Zambia, uh, just look at it very closely. It looks like a fetus. Yeah? <laughs> it looks like a fetus surrounded by countries. You know? So when you look at that, we are actually vulnerable. And a fetus is actually vulnerable. Now, we are a landlocked country. 13 million. Now, here's, here's our concern, our concern. Look at this, the percentage of stunting, 45%. Percentage of underweight, we're talking about 15%, wasting uh, uh, five, 5%. Now, the, 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 the problem here, w w what we're seeing here is that uh, we have the issues surrounding nutrition. And if you look at the matern, uh, mortality, we're talking about uh, 830 per 1,000 live birth. And yet, if you look at the Zambia, in terms of our vision by the year 2030, is to become a prosperous, a pro, a pro, prosperous mid-income country by 2030. Now, if we have stunting at 45%, by 2030, we should have at least in one digit. Can, we, can it be done? Of course, it can be done. Now, my presentation, in terms of outline, I'll mention something to do with stunting, what has been done, factors enhancing the science, scaling up nutrition, challenges, and what Zambia needs. You know, I'm a diplomat myself. I've come here to lobby. I've come here to create networks. I'd have a passion for my nutrition in my country. We need to be uh, serious about the, this whole process. But we can't, do it to, we can't do it alone, you know. I was just trying to share with you in terms of what has been happening in Zambia, for instance? For the last 20 years, we've been battling year in and out, trying to reduce malnutrition. We have not succeeded. If you look at the, the first bar there, it shows you different years. There hasn't been any improvement at all. And this is a major concern for our country. Because with this type of chronic malnutrition, we know that 
development is at stake. Now, what has been done? Now, about uh, last year, a colleague of mine came you know, with, with, with an answer to this. Said, said, okay, look, I'll cast him. We have uh, a publication in one of these journals. And in that publication, there was a roadmap, sun's roadmap. It was talking about the sun. And I was very happy. Then I said, oh, these are the same things. It will come and go. But as I talk today, eight months later, we see that there's a movement, a movement which has got a passion to actually do something about this malnutrition. But you look, if you look very carefully at the signs in terms of interventions, we in Zambia, we've been actually using the insertion nutrition actions, which basically talks about the same kind of interventions, high impact interventions, in terms of trying to address the issue of uh, uh, malnutrition. We, we, we've been talking about, we talk about infant and young children uh, feeding program, particularly this element of exclusive breastfeeding. I think there's some problem to do with the, a behavioral change. When you come to uh, the community level, we talk about growth monitoring and promotion. And then macro, macronutrient control, vitamin supplementation, uh, fortification. Uh, and recently, they, we've been hearing from Harvest Plus uh, talking about by fortification. So we are looking very carefully at these interventions. What has been done? Last year, no, 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 not last year, this year, February, I met David Nabarro in India. And I told David Nabarro that we are, all, we are organizing a high-level food and nutrition forum. And this forum is going to be um, addressed by the president. He doubted me, you know, because I've never been on this podium with him. But today I'm with him, but I challenged him. And indeed, that high-level nutrition the theme was acceleration, accelerating nutrition action. It was officially opened by His Excellency the President, Mr. Pierre Ban Bezan Banda, in February 2011. And, I, and, and, and you can see that I learned something from the daily, mission, from the daily uh, uh, conference. And this conference provided the opportunity. We are talking about the uh, platforms. We had different people different organizations of backgrounds who came together to look at the issue of scaling up on nutrition. Okay. And we made a consensus in trying to move the country forward by looking at what it is it that we want to do. And stunting was one of the biggest problems and it was given highest priority. Now, we in Zambia were fortunate in the sense that we have the National Food and Nutrition Commission, which has been designated as the sun focal point on behalf of government. So today I can make a decision to say I've been in power. National Food and Nutrition uh, Commission has taken the challenge seriously, and it is actually driving the process. Because the sun, the concept behind the sun, it, is that it has to be led by national. So it is led by national, uh, 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 it's national led. Now, one thing that has uh, happened through the consultative uh, meeting is that at the moment, we are coming up with the, the National Food and Nutrition Strategy for 2011 to 2015. And strategic direction number one, which is given the highest priority, is prevention of stunting focusing on 1,000 days of life. Now, we can't do all these things. Now, we've been making an effort to establish a multi-stakeholder platform. Now, this process, and you will notice that I'm talking about the processes, because without processes, you cannot get your output. So we've been having high-level uh, kind of meetings with different uh, line ministries, Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries, local government, 
agriculture, Minister of Health, Energy and Water. Now, we've been trying to come up with a much sectoral uh, platform. And we've actually drafted terms of reference, uh, which has been a uh, dispute for circulation to, um, to some of our members. Now, one of the things that is required is that you have to do a situation analysis. We have put up a concept not, particular mapping exercise of the sun is at advanced stage. This concept not has been developed and we've passed it on to our cooperating partners who are in charge of nutrition in our country. Now, we need to have a convener who can convene, who can actually support uh, and coordinate the, 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 the uh, commun international community. For Zambia, we are lucky. We have, there was competition. We wanted to be the lead uh, convener. So, so we're competing. Then we settled for UNICEF and DFID. Now, the, these are the conveners for the Sun, trying to uh, come up with a, a supporting mechanism in terms of funding. Other members of the, what we call uh, uh, cooperating partners for nutrition, we have the World Bank, Irish Aid, USAID, uh, I may have forgotten someone. Now, they have actually, laying, they, they are, in terms of support, they have committed to support the development of the strategic plan for, for, for Zambia in terms of the, the nutrition. And, you know, in trying to move forward, we've been trying to find out innovative ideas on how can we promote, promote or popularize the 1,000 days. We came with three banners. These are actually three banners. And these banners, the way they are actually supposed to be done is that you put the first banner, and the first banner just reads 1,000 days are critical. But, and then you don't show the other, three, the other two banners. So people started uh, trying to find out, what is this 1,000 days? They will keep on coming. And what, what is this 1,000 days? They will start asking questions. We'll be laughing at them or smiling. And the next day they'll come, they'll find we've put another banner, which says 1,000 days preventing, uh, uh, to prevent stunting. And then they, they don't get it again. All right? So they'll keep on coming. And then the third time we put another banner, which says 1,000 days of appropriate nutrition from pregnancy to two years of life are critical to preventing stunting. Benefits for all. Now, what are the factors in enhancing the sun in Zambia? We have an act in place. So the National Food and Institution Commission is a recognized government entity. It is a same autonomous body. And the chief executive officer is appointed by the board, not by the government. We have, as a policy environment, we have the National Food and Nutrition Policy, which, are, which was adopted in 2006. And this is the, the policy that we are now using to try to fit the strategy so that it speaks to the policy. Now, in government, we have also the uh, national development agenda. We have the national development plans. And the nutrition is part of those nutrition, uh, the development agenda. And it is recognized as a cross-cutting issue. I did mention about the other uh, issues, the other factors, uh, uh, talking about the Maxteca, uh, Maxteca or the approach, which we are actually looking at because when the National Food and Nutrition Commission was formed, it was taught to reduce malnutrition as an, as an organization. We found that that was not possible without the engagement of other people involved. So we have varied, a number of people, uh, a number of organizations that are involved in trying to reduce uh, this malnutrition. And the National Food and Nutrition Commission coordinates that role. We get funding grants from the government through the Ministry of Health. 
We have also supporters just like UNICEF and the UN system, they support us in most some of, some of our programs, the bilateral, also bilateral uh, agencies uh, through USAID, they also help us. And, and, and we have actually a, a CP, cooperating partners in nutrition that are currently mobilizing resources for enhancing uh, nutrition in our country. What are the challenges then? One of the challenges that we've had is this lack of concerted effort. Even if the policy exists, I think we'd have had, in terms of implementation, in terms of supporting the implementation plan, we have had no uh, funding to implement the implementation plan. And one of the other things is that we have a number of NGOs doing everything, but not coordinated. So most of the things that they do is in piecemeal. At the end of the day, we may have good results, but those results cannot be taken over because the project has now finally uh, uh, expired. So in terms of the, there was no um, sector approach. The max sector approach was actually loose. Now with this strategy that we're working on, people and organizations and other partners they have to look at the strategy carefully and try to contribute to it and they're looking at the biggest problem, which is malnutrition. The other challenge that we have, I'm glad that I'm at this meeting, is the involvement of the civil society. In Zambia, we do not have a champion, so to say, that can promote and support and Defend, uh, defend nutrition. We need that now. So that we create this, this support, the platform, so that these are the, the civil society would help us now move the agenda forward. Limited also, we have the limitation in terms of the mass media. We want, these have got to be involved in trying to push the agenda forward. Also uh, associated with that is the private sector involvement. We have limited uh, involvement of the private sector. What do we need? We need technical assistance from the cooperating, uh, cooperating partners, and particularly the global task force, in country capacity to scale up impact, uh, uh, impact interventions. We've written a concept paper and would like uh, the task force to look at that paper and make suggestions on how we can further improve it. We need high level income advocacy to lobby for increased budget allocation from the national treasury. I think the civil society could also help there. We also need um, support. As we are now working on the strategy, we need to come up with an implementation uh, plan and funding on how we are going to implement this food and uh, the national food and nutrition uh, strategy for 2011. Uh, that includes uh, impact nutrition intervention. I have already mentioned that uh, the civil society need to be mobilized and then uh, strengthening the multisectoral approach so that we can forge ahead and then start fighting the malnutrition with one voice. The line ministries are critical, uh, the private sectors, uh, the community also is critical. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Ray, uh, for your introduction. I just want to add one point uh, with my introduction that I'm representing uh, Bangladesh, which is the highest malnutrition in the world. Um, uh, today I'll talk, with, uh, talk about the Bangladesh, what we have achieved in nutrition sectors, and what our government and civil society did for the nutrition in our country, and what Sun have done. And last of all, I will share with you short story of a Rehnuma, uh, which will give you a momentum to work for the nutrition, for global undernutrition. 
Uh, I also like to thank uh, Tom Arnold and David Beckham to give me this opportunity uh, to talk about the Bangladesh in front of uh, David Navarro and Kevin and distinguished guests over here. Uh, I think you know about uh, Bangladesh. This is a very small country. Uh, it was independent in 1971 with 70 million people. After 40 years, now it is 160 million people within the same geographical area, 0.14 million square kilometer, which is the similar size of the state of Iowa of USA. And it is the mostly, most densely populated country in the world. It is about 1,100 people live in per square kilometer of you know, geographical area. Uh, uh, when the you know, sun started this movement, if you look at the beneficiaries who will get the you know, nutrition services by this sun movement, it is about 70 million reproductive age women in this country, 20 million two years old children of Bangladesh. Uh, but we have lots of achievement within these 40 years after the independence. In the last 10 years, when MDG goal have targeted for Bangladesh, within this 10 years time, we can achieve the reducing the infant mortality rate, which is on track uh, for the MDG 4, and for also the reduction of the maternal mortality rate for the MDG 5. So Bangladesh, within this population, within this pressure, we have also lots of achievement in the health sector. Uh, but what is the situation of nutrition in our country? 43% children under five are stunted, while 16% are severely stunted. 17% are wasted, and 3% are severely wasted. And 41% are underweight, and 12% are severely underweight. So you are taking the responsibility of a country where your support is needed for the nutrition. Uh, then if you look at the maternal uh, nutritional status, 26% of the women are undernized. BMI is less than 18.5. And this is the present position. But if you look at that it is, a, it is not a bad position at this moment. Uh, the achievement we have done uh, for the maternal uh, malnutrition, in 1996, it was 52%. Now in 2010, it is 26%. So we have achieved, we are progressing very quite, you know, progressive way. Uh, but there is another part of the coin. If you look at the overweight, in 1996 it was 6%, now it is 25%. So Bangladesh is, is progressing for the double burden of the malnutrition. So keeping these things in your mind when we'll talk about the malnutrition in a developing country. Uh, we have lots of political commitment. If you look at the activities of our political leaders in our country as present Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who is encouraging the nutrition activities, who is participating of the all national activities for campaign of vitamin A or observing the world based feeding week. Uh, she is directing the Minister of Health to take initiative for the nutrition. Uh, so uh, she recently uh, you know, directed Minister of Health and Family Welfare, which is two different uh, Director General for Health Services and Director General of Family Planning. Uh, so she has put this, that there should be a nutrition separate operational plan within the health program. So there will be three different operational plan for the next five years program uh, for the nutrition. One is national nutrition services and another is maternal and child nutrition for DZ health and another for the DZ family planning. Moreover, Ministry of Food and Disaster Management, they are also on board for the nutrition 
Recently, they have developed a country investment plan for the next five years, which really covered the use of the nutrition activities in our country. Ministry of Agriculture also working for the nutrition activities in our country too. Uh, there are some other international you know, partners activities. If you really like to see that what is happening in your country, as Charles said about the involvement of the Save the Children uh, in our country for the nutrition activities and other partners like Concern Worldwide, HKI, uh, then you know, other activities they are also doing. So there are some collaborative activities they have done f by the UN agencies. Uh, that's called the Millennium Development Goal Funded Joint Program, then REACH, then FANTA, then Mamuni, Manushi, and Alive and Thrive too. So uh, lots of activities is going on, funded by the USA, DFID, European Commission, as well as the World Bank and the ADB. Uh, then what is our gaps? What do you need? What is the situation? Uh, if you look at the nutritional status among the under five children, for stunting, wasting, and underweight. The critical issue is the, for the, from the sixth month up to 21 month. Then if, you know, look at the you know, nutritional state is going to decrease uh, from the sixth month and the pick up at the 21th month. So some activities which is targeted for the thousand dead, this is the appropriate for the Bangladesh. We need that type of support in our country. Then if you look at the you know, under nutrition uh, status for stunting uh, for the last 10 years, and you will find that the stagnant of the, you know, stunting position for the last 10 years. We could achieve a lot in the infant mortality, uh, um, uh, reduce the infant mortality rate, uh, even also for the maternal mortality rate, but for the nutrition, for reduction of stunting, uh, we could not able to do that much of as we could do for the uh, mortality reduction. Uh, for wasting, we can also see the same figure. So, you know, sun will act as a very uh, comprehensive way to work for the nutrition. Because within the last 10 years, we are on track for the MDGs. So, for the next five years, for targeting the MDGs goal, I think nutrition will be the main part for targeting the goal. So for the next five years, we have to really focus on the nutrition to achieve our MDGs. Uh, the another side of the nutrition for the micronutrient, around 50% of the women are you know, anemic, and 68% of the under five children are anemic. So the, in terms of the anthropometric measurement and other side of the micronutrient, Micronutrient is a very big problem in our country for the nutrition. Uh, so according to our experience, we think that we need a public ownership as prime minister is working for the nutrition, but understanding regarding the nutrition among the policy makers, we think we have to give some sort of knowledge, not working for the health perspective for the nutrition, also working for the multi-sectoral approach for education, communication, food, agriculture, and technology too. So uh, we need a you know, policy maker ownership. And if you look at our structure, over all over the country for the health sector, Bangladesh has a very good infrastructure for the health services. It has more than 13,000 community clinics to provide the services for the all over the country. It has a very big human resources. The problem is the system to deliver the nutrition services, to prioritize the nutrition when people give the services for the pregnant women or for the children. So they talk about the vaccination, but they don't talk about the nutrition. So we have to prioritize nutrition when we'll give the services for the you know, children and women. So we need some sort of operational research to find out that which way we can really strengthen our health system. We need to do the operational research to find out how we can make the collaboration between the local NGOs, local partners, as well as the international partners and public, uh, uh, public ownership. So this type of coordination uh, operational research is very uh, needed for our country. 
then we need a public-private partnership. Make an establishment between public-private partnership provide for providing the nutrition services as well as for the policy makers. And to do this thing, we need an advocacy network, partnership between you know, with different type of organization, not only for the health or for the food, you know, food ministry. We also need to include different other organizations like education, communication. And importantly, as my experience working in a you know, uh, developing country, I think media group, civil society of media group is really important to give the messages to the community people to know about what is nutrition, to make a momentum to work for the nutrition. Uh, and another also civil society group of, uh, important, I think, that is the lawyer who actually make the legislation, who has the real power in the community at national level, who can motivate the policymakers to work for the nutrition. So I think these two groups are also important to include any advocacy network in a developing country. Uh, let's, uh, um, Sun Movement already started in our country. Uh, Bangladesh government already uh, uh, identified a focal person from DZ Health and uh, she is also working for the different operational programs in our country for next five years program. Uh, then um, uh, Sun also did several stakeholders meeting and they proposed a core group uh, uh, within the national level. They also proposed four separate uh, subgroups uh, for the uh, Sun movement. And uh, they also proposed to organize a national level advocacy program by participation of the different international research centers and policy makers to motivate our uh, policy makers to include a different uh, stakeholders within this movement. Uh, then let's you know, share with you the experience of eminence, um, uh, how we can be a part, uh, how we got this opportunity to be a part of the sun. Uh, we incepted in uh, 2003 as a local NGO, and we give six different type of services for the development of the community, especially for the nutrition as well as for the health. Uh, research, advocacy, training is the main, our core area of our activities. So in this way, uh, Eminence um, uh, make a partnership with the government uh, to support technically uh, for the 11 district health services which will cover about 20 million uh, people uh, to provide the uh, health services through the community clinic project. So we'll provide the technical support for the government. As well as uh, recently we also conducted the operational research to utilize the existing resources, community level resources to improve the IYCF, which was funded by the 11th tribe and our partner, technical partner was UC Davis University. And we got a very good result uh, by using the you know, community resources in our country. So this experience actually uh, drive eminence to be a part of the national wor uh, nutrition working group at the national level. This is a non-formal working group. We meet together regularly, talk about the nutrition. Uh, this is a you know, group, uh, mostly those are working in the health area. Uh, as well as the experience of eminence working as a secretariat of non-communicable disease forum and common interest group against the tobacco, Bangladesh Urban Health Nutrition. And recently we did a campaign uh, with the policymakers to increase the tax raises for the tobacco. And uh, this is, a, I am glad to share with that this year we could able to achieve 10% increases of the tobacco. As a small organization, Eminence could do it. I think, you know, if some take this initiative, Sun can do a lot. I am really optimistic for Sun that they could do lots of things for our country. Uh, Eminence also you know, uh, um, started a uh, Bangladesh Nutrition and Food Security Network, which was earlier a, a network for the IOICF. Now we turn it into the Nutrition and Food Security Network to talk about the nutrition at national level and give the space of the journalist and the lawyer. Uh, this way, we get involved with Sun. We got opportunity to come here and got opportunity to share a small story of Rehnuma. Rehnuma is a 10 years, a 10 months old child. Her mother do work as a senior assistant coordinator in eminence in nutrition uh, department. 
she, when she was 60 days, she started to come to our office uh, because we have a place. Uh, she, uh, we wanted to ensure her breastfeeding. Then after she, uh, six months, she started her complimentary feeding. So she took everyday complimentary food on the table with us. And everybody of eminence member loves her, take care of her. So now she's getting the care from everyone. Son also need this type of care. And let me share with you, this Rehnuma, we, uh, as a, we made her as a brand for nutrition and eminence. And in all our you know, promotional materials like brochure or other things, we use her photograph. <laughs> Last of all, I hope that Sun will make Bangladesh as a global brand for achievement of nutrition. We are expecting from Sun this thing. And last of all, as Messi said that, you know, his country in a placenta, so I was thinking that time, what is the Bangladesh is? If you look at the geographical area, Bangladesh is covered by the India, and another end, there is a Bay of Bengal. So I found that Bangladesh is a position to be delivered decently. <laughs> we need a, you know, your support, your skill support to save the delivery of Bangladesh for nutrition. Thank you very much. Good morning. Let me start like the others by thanking our host, Bread for the World, particularly David Beckman and Concern Worldwide, Tom Arnold, for organizing what really is a vitally important event on a critical issue. Thank both of you for your, and your organizations for your leadership. For me, I'm thrilled to be here today in the presence of leaders from so many different organizations, international organizations, public and private, civil society, academics, and others. And it's great to see Kevin Farrell, who's an old friend with whom I worked in Zimbabwe years ago. For me, the broad participation reflected at this event really demonstrates the strong commitment that already exists to scale up nutrition, to scale up efforts that will save lives and improve opportunities for the most vulnerable people. But I really like the way that David Navarro phrased it, to address, to address what's a lifelong handicap. So I think the challenge before us is how do we expand this commitment, how do we sustain it so that we can achieve results, so that we can have impact in countries, which is what really matters. I'm in charge of USAID's Bureau for Food Security, which focuses on integrating agricultural issues with nutrition efforts. But today, obviously, I'd like to focus on the scaling up nutrition part of what we do. And again, as David Navarro said, the interventions to have success here are really known. I think that's the good news. We really know what to do. So the things I'd like to focus on, I'd like to talk about three issues that relate more to how we organize ourselves. How do we position ourselves for success? Because I think those are the critical challenges ahead. The first issue is I think success and sustainability require that we support country-led efforts, country-led strategies with a common voice and a common approach. The second is I think it's critical for donors and for civil society to align our interventions to support these country-led strategies with a really relentless focus on results. And third, I think we as donors in particular need to draw on the capacities of civil society, both local and international, and work hand in hand with this broad array of groups that bring experience and extensive reach. So let me go back to the first issue of country-led strategies. I think it's important for all of us to recognize and acknowledge that the Sun Movement itself started with countries. And in this vein, I'm honored to be here with leaders from Zambia and Bangladesh and Ghana who are galvanizing support in their countries to scale up nutrition. And for the US government's part, we're pleased to support you in your efforts. As Under Secretary Otero noted, the Obama administration has launched two major development initiatives since taking office. First is Feed the Future, and the second is the Global Health Initiative. And nutrition really is the intersection. It's the linchpin that connects these two initiatives. And those two initiatives through the link, linchpin of nutrition are the U.S. government's effort to support country-led strategies for scaling up nutrition. But be, building a sustainable movement requires more than high-level leadership. It really requires that donors change the way we do business so that the principal focus of our efforts is supporting countries who have to drive the process. So as part of doing this at USAID, we've launched a series of reforms that our administrator, Rajiv Shah, refers to as USAID Forward. And a focus of these reforms 
is changing the way we do business. It's about reshaping our assistance portfolio so that we as, as donors leave a smaller footprint. It's about recognizing that it's vitally important to build local capacity in countries at all levels, local level, national level, government, civil society. Government's an important partner, but civil society and the private sector as well. Second point I want to cover is about how USAID is aligning the way we do business and focusing on results. I have six critical points here that relate to nutrition. First is we're moving to integrate the different nutrition efforts that we have. I think we've long, like other donors, we've long invested in micronutrient supplementation, and everyone knows that that's an important piece of the puzzle. We've also invested in food-based programs for many years, and that's also an important piece of the puzzle. And we've worked extensively to improve infant and young feeding practices. We've mentioned many times today exclusive focus on breastfeeding. But I think it's important for us to recognize that there's no one solution. There's no silver bullet here. So we have to move, and we're moving at USAID to, to transition to more smartly integrate these different nutrition efforts. And if a second important change for us is achieving results requires that we, we're aware of current research and we modify our programs based on the research. And for us, that means strategically focusing our programs on the critical period from pregnancy to two years of age. That's the thousand day window that's brought us all here today. And we're aware of that research and moving smartly and rapidly to shift our programs in light of that. Third, and I think this is critically important, is thinking about indicators. I think when we, where all of uh, us who work in the development field know that what you measure is what you work on. So we've supported the development of new indicators and we're tracking ourselves based on indicators to move from what some people might call nutritionism, measuring nutrition, nutrition specific deficiencies, to looking at the minimal acceptable diet for young children, which includes infant and young feeding. And again, we have to think about indicators that focus our efforts here. The fourth area where we're changing is we're shifting our balance between prevention and treatment. I think we all know that we need to do both, and we've always invested as the U.S. government in both prevention and treatment. But again, the research really shows us that if you want to have the most cost-effective, most impactful solutions, it's critically important to shift the balance more toward prevention. So we're working on that. The fifth change we're doing is about integrating across sectors. I think maximizing synergies with sectors outside of nutrition, particularly agriculture and social protection, is critical. I think if we look at ourselves as donors, at least from the U.S. government's part, if we're honest, we have to admit that our health and our agriculture folks often don't speak the same language. But we need to see nutrition as a common objective of our health work, of our agriculture work, and of our poverty reduction and safety net programs. We know nutrition is critical to maternal and child health. In fact, every, as we've seen from the statistics today, undernutrition is a leading contributor to, leading contributor to mortality, to disease, to underperformance in school. We also know that nutrition is part of agriculture, where food can be a critical part of the solution. And we know that nutrition's role in reducing poverty and improving education is central, is central to safety net programs. So we can't, really, we can't view this as one sector versus another, which is the way I think it's often been viewed, where one sector competes for resources. We have to view it as all sectors working together, speaking the same language, and mutually reinforcing each other's objectives. And a critical way to do this is to think about a high-level goal or objective of, of think of undernutrition as a high-level goal or objective for all of these sectors. And the sixth area where we're changing the way we do business is if we're going to achieve meaningful results, and this came up in the presentation on Bangladesh, it's important that we have to emphasize moving to geographic scale. Again, as David Nabarro said, there's a lot of knowledge out there about how to do this. The interventions are known. We're at a stage where it's not important to do more pilot programs. I think the critical issue is how do we achieve impact by integrating programs, aligning donor efforts to support country-led strategies, and bringing these to scale in the near term so that we can have impact in the next couple of years. Last of the three big points I want to cover is about working with civil society. Civil society partners, as I started out saying, have tremendous experience in the field you know, of nutrition, and they bring extensive reach, often into more remote areas of countries. And for both of these reasons, they're critical to success in scaling up nutrition. But I want to share three observations that where we would like to work more deeply with civil society, where we think uh, joint collaboration can increase our impact. The first is, given the extensive experience and reach of civil society, 
I think all of us know that civil society contains uh, an enormous body of knowledge about what works and what doesn't work. And some of this has been documented and communicated, but to be frank, a lot of it hasn't. And it's vital for us, for the US government, I'm sure for other donors, that field-based perspectives that civil society brings are used to inform policies and to adjust programs. So within USAID, we're barking on an ambitious learning agenda under Feed the Future, and we want to place strong emphasis on monitoring and impact evaluations. But as key partners for civil society, we have to look to all of you to help guide us in our efforts to tell us what works, what doesn't work, what's feasible. We don't have the luxury of starting from scratch, and we need to create systems where we can draw on that expertise and knowledge that you have and in real time get it down to the field so that best practices can be spread out. The second is, as donors work to align with country strategies, I would argue that it's equally vital for civil society actors as well to support unified country-led approaches. There's a lot of good work that can be done, but I think we all know that impact requires scale again and achieving high-level outcomes. If we want to achieve outcomes in the range of 20 to 30 percent reductions in undernutrition in countries, that requires great coordination and unity of effort among all actors. If we want to save lives and improve opportunities for most vulnerable people, it means that our investments can't be disparate or fragmented, as David Nabarro said. They have to be focused and aligned across the range of actors. Last point about civil society is we have a diverse set of international and local civil society partners in this room, and that's tremendously heartening to us. But I think we all recognize that at the end of the day, we're returning back to one of my earlier points, for all of our efforts to be sustainable, for the Sun Movement to be sustainable, for the Thousand Days Partnership to be sustainable, we have to build stronger local communities that have the capacity to continue doing all the work that they're doing, to continue the advocacy, to continue implementing programs, focusing on results and telling the story of scaling up nutrition so that more and more countries and actors get on board. Capacity for us at local level has to be the overriding objective. It's easy to set up systems where donors deliver food and health care, for instance, through, through, um, through governments. <clears throat> but if countries, sorry, through their own governments, through civil society and private sector, don't develop the capacity to address hunger, then I don't think we can look at ourselves honestly and claim that we've achieved success. Building capacity at local levels is what's absolutely vital to, vital to sustainability. So thanks again for this opportunity, and I look forward to the questions. We have two microphones in the uh, aisles here in the center. And if you have questions for our panelists, uh, line up at the mics, and we'll get to your questions. Until somebody is there, though. Um, it was interesting to see some of the year-on-year -year trending from individual countries, because in no case can you wipe out stunting or wipe out uh, malnutrition. Uh, you do a series of small single-digit percent reductions year-on-year -year and over time uh, achieve something pretty substantial. But all these gains, it seems to me, are very vulnerable. They're fragile. Uh, one or two years of no rain, or in the case of Bangladesh, too much rain, and all of a sudden, you're back to the same metrics that you were facing five or six years ago. Uh, it can wipe out all the gains you've made uh, and worked so hard to achieve. Uh, even something like economic crisis among your donors, which uh, lessens the appetite for helping people on the other side of the planet, as we're finding here in the United States can suddenly make very fragile things that you've worked very hard to achieve. So I'm interested in, in how you build a protective shell around some of these gains and make sure that there isn't loss when suddenly the price of oil, for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with your country, when they double, suddenly the price of food to market is much higher, the price of inputs is much higher, and all your planning uh, suddenly is under threat. Ray, you obviously raise a very important point, and it can't be uh, sort of swept under the rug on the one hand. On the, on the other hand, 
several of the key factors that uh, um, we have talked about um, have, have a kind of upfront cost, and then once you're through that, um, they have a long-term sustainability. I mean, immediate and exclusive breastfeeding. If you get that done, um, you know, that, that has an enormous, enormous impact forever. Once attitudes have changed, once you have a critical mass all over a country for doing that, even comp complementary feeding and foods and so on and so forth. So, so a big piece of this, once, once you've gotten over the, uh, the peak or so on of, uh, of, of change at the household level and the community level and the attitude level can go on and on regardless of, of these other uh, macroeconomic changes. Yeah, the question you asked is a very, very important question. And I think that as countries scale up nutrition, they really have to build into it some of the safety nets that will actually protect the, most, the poor and the vulnerable. Because very often they are the most, they are the most likely to be affected by the conditions that uh, we are talking about. For example, a country is improving the agriculture. You know, it shouldn't be such that we should look at how we can process some of our foods so that when there is a drought for a period, have we been able to, can we store some of our foods so that it will not affect us? You know, increasing your food production and not putting into place uh, mechanisms to have something like a food bank to protect during those periods, we will always end up with the situation we are talking about. So I think that it's important that we think through the safety nets that go with some of these uh, interventions we are talking about in scaling up of nutrition. I, I think the point that you've raised is, is a very critical one because it, look, it actually looks at the success and the failures. I think in our case, uh, what we've realized is that, uh, you know, if you do not have a plan and you are not anticipating these things, then I think whatever you have made in the last five years would be actually wiped up. Now, for Zambia, we are actually uh, privileged that at the moment we are working on the uh, national food and nutrition strategy. And one of the directions in that strategy is to come up with a mitigation plan. And uh, this is a mitigation that is actually be, and it's going to be it's cutting across, which means that we've got different sectors that are involved in safety nets, education, uh, environment, all these, all these uh, uh, factors are actually uh, 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 considered in the National Food and Nutrition Commission. So that is where we should start. Because if we lose whatever we've started, then we're not going to gain anything at all. Thank you. For my understanding, um, I'd like to share an experience, a research study, evaluation study after the CEDUR and that was a natural climate in southern part of the, our country. Uh, and we did the evaluation, the nutritional impact of that you know, climate uh, and disaster effect in southern areas. And we found that you know, the practice related to the hygiene was earlier bad compared to, to the, you know, after the disaster because lots of uh, intervention came to that area uh, people came forward to support that uh, area's people, so they made different type of, um, you know, sanitary and water uh, supplies in that area. So they changed their lifestyle in the positive way. So at your point, as you said, that if something problem related to the international, like climate change problem, uh, disaster problem, uh, or maybe price of the high for the oil, or some other issues. So this might affect some local uh, or small countries like Bangladesh. But that time we need international support. So this sun could be a platform internationally to act this type of upcoming effort in our country. So maybe this is the problem, local problem, but we have to think it as a international problem. Then we have to act for as an international way. Thank you. Like the other panelists, this is a vitally important, I think this is a vitally important question. We've seen cases around the world where hard fought development gains are really washed away very quickly in countries. But there are other cases where people in Brazil was an example mentioned earlier where you've seen that sustained commitment brings sustained gains. 
And I think the way to address this issue is you need sustained political commitment and then you need to build resiliency at both the community level and the government level. Kevin Farrell talked about the household level. It really is about building resiliency at the household level, building assets so communities can withstand some of the shocks that necessarily come that are outside of their controls and building strength and capacity at the government level to plan for these issues and to implement safety net programs. In extreme cases, food assistance at the international level is obviously something that's always going to be necessary for those cases, but we need to build a system where households and governments have the resiliency to respond. Tell us who you are and make your question an actual question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm John Coonrod. I'm with The Hunger Project. And, uh, I really appreciated uh, Mr. Weisenfeld's comment about building local capacity, and specifically the capacity of the only level of government that actually touches the people who walk, the women who walk. They don't get on buses, they don't get on cars, so government to them is within 10 kilometers. It's the Union Parishads in Bangladesh and sub-district level um, government in Zambia. I'm just wondering, and I, certainly our experience has been that civil society has a tremendous role in building local government capacity. And I want to, would love to hear from both Mr. Masi and Mr. Talnakar what you see as being done at the policy level to strengthen that level of government that is directly <laughs> responsive to the people on this nutrition front, to build the platform there in the communities and how can civil society work in partnership with you to do that? Thank you very much for, for that question. I think I did mention uh, in my presentation that the civil society in terms of addressing nutrition in Zambia at the moment is, is actually lacking. Uh, most of the civil societies that are present now are in poverty reduction, but we also know that nutrition can go through the poverty reduction line. Um, and then if you look around, uh, in, uh, when we had HIV, the HIV uh, has actually created a number of civil society, all of a sudden, all right? Now for the Zambian situation, I think there are two ways of actually doing it. Uh, we see that the present, the, the civil society that are currently there, the first instance, the society for uh, poverty reduction. And they can, they can start thinking about nutrition programs within their structures. Uh, if that is not possible, then I was thinking loudly that why don't we also form what we call Zamsan. Now, Zamsan will be like Zambian Alliance. You know, I'm thinking loud for scaling up nutrition. So it becomes Zamsan. So th those are some of the in initiatives that we can think about. But uh, what we have also noted is that our interface our interface with the local communities is actually not on the strongest side. We have the decentralization policy in Zambia, which we are still having a problem with that. And that is where we would like to go. I mean, give power to the people. After all, what's the proper, what's the proper, what is this issue of democracy if we can't give power to the people? Now, in the civil society, I expect the existing societies that are current now, and with our coordinating role, I think we will start, starting, we will start talking now, because we want to ensure that the civil society are part to this in terms of contributing to the uh, success of the sun. Thank you. I hope I have answered your question. Um, you know, uh, in our country, among the policy makers, we have different uh, parliamentary committee, uh, like um, uh, standing committee for the health and standing committee for the, you know, um, uh, finance ministry, standing committee for different things. Uh, so whenever we do some sort of advocacy activity in our country, we uh, try to involve this standing committee as a policy maker advocacy. Uh, my, my, but in terms of the nutrition, uh, I think if we can make a different standing committee involving different stakeholders or you know, ministries from 
policy makers of different ministries, that will give a you know, multi-sectoral policy makers involvement. Uh, so I think uh, this could be one way to involve different policy makers uh, to talk about the nutrition and do work for the nutrition in Bangladesh. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for what I think uh, has inspired me a lot this morning. My name is Paul Amuna, and I am representing the African Nutrition Society. Um, I just want to make a few points in relation to this very session, which is about forming a movement. And my understanding of it is this, that from what all the speakers have said, there's a clear need for champions at every level. Secondly, there's a clear need for political will, and there's a clear need for us to actually have a system that allows nutrition, not just mere visibility, but actually its ability to thrive in all the ways that have been described here this morning. I want to just raise this question. Is it not time that within our national governments and parliaments, we had not a parliamentary group for health, but parliamentary group specifically for food and nutrition. That's number one. The second is that, is it not time, since at the level of the UN, we are talking about sun, that national governments have signed up to this in principle, that nutrition, rather than being a small part of health, has a ministry of its own which draws together all the various important stakeholders who will contribute to the whole process. I'm pleased to note that the USAID policy is about empowering and encouraging, you know, sort of development of local capacity and supporting things at local level. I'm really encouraged by that, and I'm, I feel really happy that this is the policy of the US government. I would like us to consider these issues. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I won't comment specifically on structuring parliamentary committees or ministries, but I think your question really does highlight something that's, as, uh, that's come up in recent years, and David Nabarro highlighted it, is an understanding that a, a historical stoved pipe structure of agriculture on one hand, health on another, and nutrition being a small component of health is not leading us towards success. It's not achieving the results that we need to achieve. All of the research in the last several years shows conclusively that you need to integrate those programs. So whether you integrate ministries or not, we need to find ways of working together across the different sectors. If you're gonna address childhood undernutrition, stunting, wasting, it has to be a multi-sectoral approach. And I think different countries can approach that in different ways as to how they integrate those through their institutional structures. But at the high level, we have to integrate. And I, I think the way to do it, the way we're approaching it, is to, to have a unified set of high level outcomes. If activities across the different sectors are, are working towards one set of outcomes, that forces people to work together. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Susan Shepard, Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, I have a question for Mr. Weisenfeld, but first a comment that I think sets up the question. So Médecins Sans Frontières, thanks to the model developed by Concern a number of years ago, has gone from treating uh, 60, 000, 50 or 60,000 severely malnourished children a year to 300,000 severely malnourished children in 2010. And much of this work is done in Niger in partnership with local NGOs that have um, arisen in the course of our presence in that country. And we've also not only moved towards integrating nutrition into our health activities in a very multi inter integrated approach, but moved towards prevention. But the point being is that the, all of this may be cost effective, but it is certainly not cheap. And so what I'm, we hear today a lot of initiative about, you know, scaling up and doing new things, but where is the money going to come from? We heard Senator, uh, we heard Hillary Clinton mention a fourfold increase in funding to Tanzania, but we all know that we're in budgetary 
we're in budgetary scale down mode. So my question is where um, are there you know, other countries where you are also going to increase funding? How is this budgetary crisis going to affect your actual funding of nutrition programming? Thank you. Thank you, I was hoping for an easier question. <laughs> um, budget issues are tough. Obviously everyone knows that we're in a tight budget constraint in the United States. It's not limited to the United States. I think it's an issue that a lot of other countries are facing. Um, but the, and I can't predict what the U.S. Congress will do with the budget. So I can't say what's going to happen for 2012 because ultimately in the United States the budget arises from the U.S. Congress. What I can say is that the, the Obama administration has committed to prioritize Feed the Future. Feed the Future is that initiative that integrates both agriculture and nutrition programs and in the tight budget environment of 2011 we are prioritizing Feed the Future and providing close to full funding for the initiative. That means other programs will suffer, but the recognition is that, again, because of the research, because it's, it's well known how to address these problems, that we need to prioritize this, and prioritize it in a set of countries that have also shown their commitment, because you, the U.S. government can't do this alone, and, and the Irish government can't do this alone, and the two of us can't do it together. We need resources from host countries. So we're working in countries that themselves have shown a strong commitment to allocate their budgetary resources, that have country-led strategies, they've developed unified strategies that ask donors to buy in. In those types of countries, we're prepared to prioritize our limited resources and invest in them. And we have to start somewhere. We're not going to be able to address this issue in every country in the world, but we have within Feed the Future, we have 20 focus countries, and we want to, we're prioritizing those countries. We want to start there, show success, demonstrate a way forward, and galvanize support from others. Thank you very much. Greetings to everybody. I'm called Peter Milton Rukundo from the Uganda Action for Nutrition uh, within the Pearl of Africa. My question really goes to colleagues on the panel regarding the structural obstacles that may hinder our progress uh, in this process. Colleagues especially from Zambia and, and Bangladesh. What about the, the legal and policy challenges that come with, for example, the challenge uh, of inadequate legislation uh, that prohibits adequate maternal leave paid maternal leave. In Uganda, we have realized it's a very big challenge uh, that women are not allowed uh, leave for six months to exclusive breastfeed. And there are no baby-friendly hospital uh, initiatives there. And there are no even facilities in the workplace that support exclusive breastfeeding. And for sure, that message is failing because women have to go to work. Most of the women here who are educated will, will tell you that it was difficult to stay home for six months. How do we address the challenge uh, of, of the private sector failing to accept women to take leave? And even the, uh, even the CSOs here, some managers here will tell you that they don't give the six months leave which is paid uh, to the women working in the organizations. How do we address these challenges? Uh, second also is the problem of coordination. Uh, to coordinate this process requires a convener, uh, requires money, and requires a secretariat, perhaps. In Uganda, we have tried to do that with support from various CSOs, but the challenge has been who coordinates the process. Some CSOs are fighting each other. Uh, you say USAID, uh, and this one is specific to you, uh, you have many projects in these countries uh, that are targeting nutrition, and you find they are isolated. They don't link together. So, is the USID or partners here, especially in a borough from UN, willing to support this coordination process? Because we realize it's going to be a big challenge if you leave it to everybody and no one's responsibility in the coordination. It may really take a long time to achieve progress. Then the last one really to, to our colleagues is... Why don't, why don't we stop there? Yes. We'll do, stop. We, do we scale up existing... No, no, I really mean it. Why don't we stop there? You don't get to ask three questions, though. Look at your colleagues here waiting to, to ask questions. Uh, Dr. Lardy, why don't we start with you? A uh, question on breastfeeding directed specifically to two guys. Actually, I'd rather have you answer it. Okay. Um, I think that it's the issue of um, exclusive breastfeeding for six months. We all know how important it is. And indeed, he has raised an important issue that we say one thing, and yet our policies do not support what we want uh, women or, or countries to do. I think that this is the area that civil society can play an important role. You know, you are, it's the civil society, we are the people that ultimately put people in power, 
in governments and whatnot. And I think that if we are united and we raise our voice and say that this is crucial for the growth and development of our country and of our children, I'm sure that our policy makers will listen to us. I think sometimes as you know, individuals we, and in civil society, we don't realize the power we have. I think let's see what is happening around us. If civil society is united in saying that this is what we think should be done, this is a policy that governments must put in place to help children, they will listen to us. Thank you. I just uh, want to one important point, as Bangladesh is a poor country and there is a lot of nutrition problem. But on the other hand, the achievement of the civil society for promotion of the breastfeeding in our country. And uh, last year, Prime Minister uh, announced the six month of maternity leave for ensuring the exclusive breastfeeding in our country. So, you know, as a, a small country, Bangladesh, <laughs> If they can take this type of economical decision at the policy level, I think this could be an example for other country too. Thank you. <laughs> June Kim with the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Um, my question is, there are a lot of us, um, local and indigenous uh, learning uh, and uh, knowledge on how to combat nutrition using local plants and um, uh, I guess uh, plants out there like moringa or soybeans. What, where is there a mechanism in this, whether it's uh, in the 1,000 Days to Scale of Nutrition or in the Feed the Futures program, where these kind of learnings can feed into low cost ways of combating malnutrition, especially in, you know, in a climate where fundings uh, might not be uh, readily available or ongoing. And how, and the second question is, you know, does uh, donor countries like U.S. and other governments, uh, are, th are, are you thinking of models in which uh, that minimizes dependency of our brothers and uh, sisters in developing countries on these kind of funding? Hello, thanks. That's uh, an important question about looking at indigenous practices that are effective in scaling up nutrition. There's, there's some good research out of Vietnam, for instance, that shows how local practices on, on mixing in vegetables into child feeding, uh, uh, child me meals for children had a huge impact on nutrition. So I think that's absolutely right. Our approach, is, again, is to follow country-led strategies. So we don't want to develop approaches from Washington. We know overall what works and what doesn't work and that because the knowledge is out there. But we want to support countries in developing strategies and approaches in specific geographic areas of their country where there is undernutrition. And part of that has to be looking at not just which children are undernourished, but which children are actually very well nourished. Because if you have 20% undernourishment or 50% undernourishment, that means a lot of kids are doing very well. So take a serious look at who's doing well and why and, and follow these indigenous practices and make them country-led. To just make a comment on, as we progress with the sun movement in countries and the issue you raised about dependency on donors, you see, I think that if countries will show commitment they should show commitment by also putting aside resources to support it. It shouldn't be totally dependent on, you know, just what donors are bringing. Countries have some money, they have something. They should show that they are committed to this effort. Without that, I, I don't see how serious we are about addressing malnutrition. We say it should be country-led. Country-led, start by committing something to it. Otherwise, it's just lip service. <laughs> 